Amen. Well, do you remember about a month ago, uh, maybe a little longer, I had shared a message called Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord. Anybody remember? And I couldn't get to, to the next part of it because, you know, things happen, you know, as you just saw, things happen. So I didn't get to the second part of it, and today's the day that I get to do it. And, and so it's been over a month. So this is Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord, part two. And it's on covenant relationships. I said, you know, God, only you have the timing on this stuff. You're amazing. And I don't know who put this little note up here, but it says, uh, smile, Jesus is watching you. (laughs) Who did that? Did you do that? Well, look at there. There's your notes. Smile. You did a good job. You have a pretty smile. He did it. It was a reminder for him to smile. I think we all need to smile because Jesus is watching us. All right. I'm just going to do a quick review. Quick review. I tell you, there's an anointing on worship day. So I can hardly, I'm going to buzz through because, whoa, pre-service was amazing. Amazing. All right. We talked about preparing the way of the Lord and and, and talked what Nadine just said about our persona being our weapon. And David, you know, who remembers David? And he went with his slingshot and he killed that old giant, you know, that Goliath. And how he was made to put on Saul's armor. And it didn't fit, remember? It was in the way. He couldn't carry that armor. Right? You can't wear someone else's persona and believe that you're going to conquer anything. God has equipped you, and you are you. You are who God created you to be, and it's you that's going to whoop the devil, not someone else's mantle, but your mantle. Amen? I don't go seeking after, and neither does David for years and years. This has been on our heart. We don't go seeking after man's anointing. I don't want Benny Hinn's anointing. I don't want Bill Johnson's anointing. I love them all. But I have to be happy with the anointing that God has given to me. And you need to be happy with the anointing God has given you because it's a perfect fit. And besides that, Gabe, right? The anointed one lives in us. So who wants someone else's anointing anyway? Right? You can't get more anointed than you are with Jesus Christ living in you, the anointed one. So he's equipped you. So he threw it off. And what he did immediately after that, he took his staff in his hand. His staff was his persona at that time, shepherd. You go, wow, all of that armor. And he took his staff, you bet, because your persona is powerful. It is warfare. I tell you, every demon screams when you wake up, as Nadine said, and you know who you are. The enemy runs. It's when you don't know who you are, he laughs. And then you know what he can do? He comes in with deception and changes you into something you wouldn't even recognize. So we don't want to be messing with someone else's equipment, right? We have our own. And then I love, again, because that's a big deal in preparing for the way of the Lord, is to know who we are. Know our persona. What's our persona? Well, it's how God sees you. So today when you go home, go in your prayer closet and say, God, how do you see me? And start writing what he gives you. Who are you? How does he see you, Christy? How does he see you? I tell you, you're a mighty woman of God. And I tell you, you scare every demon within miles of the place. When you wake up in the morning, they go, oh, no, she's up again. Amen. Amen. That's who you are. That light that, that Crystal was talking about in the books, Frank Peretti books, that light that shines out of us. Whoever gets in a pit, raise your hand. I never get in a pit. (laughs) But that's why you have people around you that raise you up. David's mighty men. You're David's. You're Dee Dee's mighty men and women. 
You're David's mighty men and women in this place to lift us up when we need it. You're there to lift us up. So, (laughs) David killed the lion and the bear. So he was prepared for the giant. And he knew just how to do it. And I tell you what, he killed the bear and he killed the lion. But guess what happened? The lion came back. He wasn't all the way dead. He learned something. So when he shot Goliath with the sling, bam, he went, he didn't have a sword, remember? He didn't have a knife. He had nothing. He had a slingshot. But he went to the enemy. And what the enemy was trying to use against him, he took it out of the sleeve and he cut the head off of that giant where he would never again be able to come at him. He was deader than a doorknob. He was dead. The enemy's been coming at you. And I love what happens. Bill Yant had a word to people behind prison. You know, the prisoners, those that are behind prison, those precious ones. I don't even want to say prisoners. Those people behind bars. And their treasures truly locked up. And he said they will be the most awesome warriors when released from prison because they will use what the enemy used against them to go do war and to bring in the harvest and to help others that they experience themselves to release them out of captivity. So you will go and take the weapon of the enemy, break it, and use it against the enemy against him and nail him amen I just love what David did all right now we're going to move on Isaiah 45 3 I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I the Lord who call you by your name am the God of Israel treasures of darkness and hidden riches and secret it means armory it means a treasury and an armory in other words weaponry when you're going through dark times and trials and tribulation and the enemy is beating up on you the entire time the scripture that says do not look at the things that you see for they're temporary they're passing away all right subject to change but look at the things that are not seen for the invisible realm because those are eternal so the whole time the enemy beats up on us there is an eternal weight of glory being deposited inside of us an armory weaponry being deposited for such a time as this and the surprise is on hell Not only did the enemy not take us out, but we jumped up with a shout and war in our hands and we whooped the devil with the weaponry that was deposited in us during that season. Isn't that awesome? That is the secret treasures in darkness. All right. We're going to go to now people in the New Testament. I only touched on it last time, but I'm going to concentrate on Paul and how God prepared him for prepare ye the way of the Lord. For what God was doing and would do in Paul's life, he needed preparation, right? Look where he came from. He was an absolute terrorist. He would have made ISIS proud. They would have recruited Paul. And that same demon power recruited Paul to go kill Christians and to persecute Christians and to throw them into jail. He was Saul at the time. But then 
God had his way because God saw his future and God lives in your future. He doesn't live in the past. He lives and he lives in all of it, but he's in our future and he's beckoning us toward the future. He's pulling us from the past, even from our present, and he's pulling us into our tomorrow because he knows who you are. He sees who you are. You're powerful. This too will pass. Yes, it's already passed. In the realm of the spirit, this is already passed. We're already living in our tomorrow. Everybody's going, well, I sure don't feel like it. (laughs) But we don't go by that. We're seated in heavenly places where it's Christ Jesus. We are spirit beings, right? So we look at the perspective from that heavenly place and we can see our future. Without a vision, the people... So there must be a vision available. We must be able to see. We must be able to have and have ability to see a vision. Or the Bible wouldn't say without a vision we perish or we'd all perish and that's it. Right? So without a vision we perish. So we have a vision. Where do we get the vision? From God. Lord God. Because I'll tell you what, when you're going through it, you need a vision. Because the thing you're seeing with your physical eyes and your emotional being is running amok. It is a false vision. You need to go into the realm of the spirit. Ask the Father God, what is the vision? What is your vision for me? What is my future? And watch God just blow your socks off with blessings. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 20, in 22, 12, 11 and 12, right? 22, 11 and 12. Four, what is it? 29, 11. Thank you. Thank you, body. You pull me out of so much. 29, 11 and 12. For I have given you a plan, right? A plan to prosper you, not for calamity, not for heartache, not for sickness and disease, right? A future and a hope. Faith without hope is. We need it or we're going to be a lot of dead people. We need to die. We need to be dead in the flesh. But we need to be alive in hope. Right? For faith to catch hold. So here's Paul. He was prepared for all of these battles for this moment to actually make such an impact governmentally and judicially. When he was persecuted, when he was beaten, when he was tormented, you know, I love what he said. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. He did not care about his living situation his focus even unto death his focus was fulfilling the commitment and covenant that he made he had a covenant relationship with Jesus and with the brethren he didn't just cut and run when things got a little tough he didn't say see you Jesus When things might have gone a little awry, like getting beaten up, or maybe he didn't like the synagogue fellowship that he was in. I'm just going to cut and run. The Western world does not get covenant relationship. They just don't. We don't. We don't. We just, huh. And then when something happens, oh, can you, Pastor Risa, can you help me? And you know what we do? Of course. Of course we can. Of course we can. Marriages. Well, you know, it looks a little prettier on the other side. Will you just go over on that other side of the fence and see all of those big holes and all those other little things? You know, those little things. That are hidden with makeup and lipstick and wigs and whatever else beguiles you. 
when the wigs fall off and the eyelashes come off. <laughs> then let's see what's prettier on the other side of that fence. <laughs> All right, so here's Paul. Here's Paul, and, and so he is wanting to, he appealed to Caesar. He knew who he was. His weapon was in full array and operational. He knew the plan, the greater plan, what David, I'm taking off what David was preaching last week about the greater purposes of God. There was a greater purpose. The jail was a vehicle to get him to the greater purpose. If you looked at that situation in the natural mind, you could go into the, why me? Look at all, look at, you know, I wish I was Stephen. Just kill me, God. <laughs> Stephen got to go home early. Look at me. <laughs> but Paul saw through the stuff through the beatings, through the persecution, for the greater purposes in the kingdom of God. The greater purposes. There's a greater purpose. When things hit you, there's a greater purpose. It's an attempt of the enemy to stop the greater purpose. And you have a choice. You can agree with the enemy to say, oh, you know what, I'm giving up. Or you can throw that to the side, kick it like David did, like you showed Kick it. I can't do it like you. Get up and do it. Show everybody how you kick it. You got to get up and you got to show them how you do it. Yeah. There's just a, there's a little thing there. You know, wow. You know, he's got balance. <laughs> so the greater purposes of God. So Paul is brought before the audience of major players in the government. Right? Look what, he ha look what happened. He went before Felix. I love it. He was a procurator of Judea. Had many conversations with he and his Jewish wife. They kept bringing him in to speak to them. They kept, why? Because the favor of God and anointing of God and the truth of God was in him. And he was taking advantage of everything. He thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the devil pay and I'm going to rub his nose in the blood of Messiah. And you need to start rubbing the nose of the enemy in the blood of Jesus. Whether it's your marriage is being attacked or your finances or your health, it's time to rise up and make him pay. Instead of run away, make him pay. Remember that this way, okay? It's like a song. Instead of run away, boom, boom, you make him pay, boom, boom. Instead of run away, boom, boom, you make him pay. You're going to be singing that in the shower. It's going to be invading your dreams. I will not run away. I will make him pay. I will not run away. I will not go into depression. I'm going to get a revelation. Amen. So in the midst of all of this, he had audience with Felix. Then Festus. Now this was delayed two years. His release two years so two years, he's speaking it, speaking it, speaking it. I believe one of the first people that Paul saw when he went to heaven, if they went before him, was Felix and his Jewish wife that came to a saving knowledge of their Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen? That is the vengeance when it says the vengeance of God. It's not God just killing people. That's not the nature of our God. No, the vengeance of God is to see your enemies come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is vengeance on the enemy, isn't it? Whoa, that's powerful stuff. I just love it. 
All right. So then here comes Festus. And he had great favor with him, even protecting him when he was ambushed. Remember, there was a big plan and strategy in the book of Acts in that part where they were trying to ambush Paul. But here's this worldly guy, governmental authority, that protected I tell you what, you have a protection over you. Wow, the favor of God is over you. The governmental authority that he wielded. Is that awesome? Then I love, this is probably my favorite, is King Agrippa. Here comes the non-assuming King Agrippa. And you know, they said he could have been... He could have been released. They found absolutely nothing wrong. He was innocent. They found, they said, we could release him, except that he appealed to Caesar. Absolutely. You know, we could have stopped the whole lawsuit. We could have. But the Lord God showed us the bigger plan. He showed us the greater purpose, and it was a spiritual mantle of authority that we had to go all the way, if you can believe it, to the Supreme Court of Colorado to get the authority spiritually, governmentally, and judicially. That was the bigger plan of God, right? So Paul knew he wasn't worried because he's dead. You know, he's been beaten, everything. You know, he's experienced all. He's dead. But the greater purpose for the kingdom, the influence, the influence. And so King Agrippa, he'd go into King Agrippa, had audience with King Agrippa. Who's your audience, your boss? Are you influencing or are you being influenced? Brother Lance, Lance Shipley, when you go to Florida, you're going to influence. You're going to influence and not be influenced. When you go, because I tell you right now, the enemy is hot on the tail of Christians. And if you don't influence, if you're not bold, and you've got the boldness of Christ, who here is baptized the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand. Then you're endued with that boldness. You have the boldness. You don't need the boldness. You have it in you to influence. If you don't influence you will be influenced in this hour. This is prepare ye the way of the Lord. His glory is beginning to pour out all over this world. The enemy's not just sitting, you know. Oh, look. Oh, look, little demons. Look at the body of Christ doing healings. Look at the body of Christ influencing Oh, well, we just can't do anything about that. To think that is stupid. Be not ignorant of the enemy's devices. Right? The enemy, he seeks whom he, well, I'm good. She's scaring me. Good. The fear of God. Anyone can fall. We've seen it. Anyone is susceptible. But when your gifts are in operation, and when you're whipping that persona sword out there, and you know who you are in Christ Jesus, and no one will be able to influence you, you're going to whoop the enemy. You're going you're to bring the truth of God. You're going to bring the love of God, all those weapons, the blessing of God, the repentance, all of those awesome weapons. You think, what can a little stone do? Well, what can blessing my enemy do? Let me tell you, it can flatten them into repentance. That's what blessing can do. Do not underestimate the spiritual weaponry of love. Love conquers all. That's a huge sword. Wham! The Your enemies, people, those that have been persecuted, can't resist the love of Christ that flows through you. So, on his way to Caesar, okay, he's on his way to Rome. Oh, and King Agrippa said this, wow, now this is my, this is my translation, whoa, Paul, you keep talking like this, 
and I just may convert to Jesus. That's what King Agrippa said. And I'm going to tell you this. Whoa! I know King Agrippa became a Christian and a believer. I know he did because his word goes forth and accomplishes that for which it was sent. Right? Then it says, then the mountains and the hills break forth with what? Singing. And the trees of the field clap their hands and rejoicing because his word does accomplish, accomplish that for which it was sent. So I know he came to Jesus. And it doesn't show that Paul went to Caesar, but we know he went to Caesar because it says that uh, in, I love this, Philippians 4.21, it says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. This is Paul speaking. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of the Caesar's household. So he, he was getting, he was infiltrating that place too. Isn't that awesome? Whoa, we're infiltrating everywhere we go. So then he was shipwrecked. That wasn't all enough. He got shipwrecked. See, I would have been over the side of the boat because I get seasick. <laughs> well, just take authority over it. I've tried. <laughs> and I, I probably would have just jumped and said the agony. Too much. I'll, I'll go to heaven early. But Paul went to Malta. Here's this island with all these natives. <laughs> and they were nice and hospitable to them. And so Paul was gathering the wood for the fire, and here comes a viper. Now, see, there's vipers everywhere, people. Ready to bite you. They're everywhere. Are you ready for it? Yes, you are. Say, yes, I am. The poison of Satan will not detour me. Say that. The poison of Satan will not detour me. So here he was, and it said it. Hung. I mean, it was like his teeth. And there it is. And what does it say? It says that he shook it off. We need to shake it off, people. Shake off temptation. Do not submit to temptation, for it will overtake you if you submit to it. But the Bible says, resist the enemy, submit to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee. He had a choice in this moment to believe what said in Mark, his last words, Jesus, to his disciples, that no deadly thing that you drink and that all serpents, remember that? If they bite, it will not have effect. He could choose to believe that. That no sin has taken me that is such as common to man. Then it says, but I will with that temptation make a way of escape. There is none of this. I I couldn't help sinning. The devil made me do it. That's not the word of God. That's not what my word. That's not what the word of God says to me. It says, with that temptation, I've made a way to escape it. But you have to go to God. You have to go to God and say, God, what's the way of escape? What's it? could be calling a friend. It could be getting in the word of God. Worship, praise, whatever it is, there's a way of escape, people. If it's depression, worship. Heaviness. Let him give you a garment of praise for that spirit of heaviness. He shook it off, and guess what happened on that island? All these people got healed. He got the head dude, the head citizen in that place. His father was sick with fever. He just walked in. Paul, Jesus walked in, got healed. And then all the natives came that were sick. They got healed. We walk in that kind of anointing. It's who we are. It's who we are. Amen? So let's quickly go to John 17. And I'm going to read the entire chapter because this is called covenant. This is Jesus 
declaring covenant over his people and with us. Actually, um, chapters 14 through 17 is known as the farewell chapters of Jesus. He was tying up business. He was declaring over his disciples the most important things that they needed to know. By the way, I'm just getting this. If you're drinking, and it, it, if you're drinking in here, alcohol, and you have to have it, you're an addict. You need to get delivered because it's biting you right now. There's a couple people in here, and, and, and the, the enemy of alcoholism is, is the viper is on you. The poison has not yet gone in. You need to break it off before that gets you in the name of Jesus. Okay. Um, Jesus said this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you. This is the prayer of Jesus, Yeshua. Do you think his prayers come to pass? And who is he praying for? Say me. That you may know him, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you, Lord, have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh God, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He left it all. He left the glory. He left it all. He chose to leave it all. Paul chose to lay it all down. Stephen chose to lay it down. We all need to choose to lay it down and stop wanting our own way. And if things don't go this way or that, we're ready to cut and run. Out of relationships, friendships, marriages, lay it down. He left it all for you and I. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. Listen to that. And they have received them. Have we received them? And have known surely that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? This is Jesus. But for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. I could feel right in there the urgency of his heart. He deposited and deposited and deposited and deposited and deposited and deposited in these precious ones. Oh, God, keep them. Keep them from the enemy. Keep them Oh, God, keep them. Holy Spirit, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Oneness is critical in this hour. We need each other. We need the body of Christ. The anointing in this house of the breaker, the anointing in this house of the agreement is so powerful and so precious that words cannot even describe the anointing of oneness. 
While I was with them in this world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Praise God. Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Be not conformed to this world, Romans says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will know the perfect will of God. Who wants to know the perfect will of God? Then you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind because when you are and you're not conformed to this world system that is screaming for your deposits of money, I love what Drew said, Deposits of money into your eye gate that we're to keep holy. Now, we go to movies, rarely. We usually wait till they come out on video. But we're very selective at what we put in our eye gate. And our ear gate. But now I come to you in these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they were not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through your word. That they will be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. These are the last words that Jesus, some of the last words that he imparted to his disciples. Oneness and unity is preparing the way. It was vital in the upper room. Go, pray, wait. They were in one accord in prayer, it says in Acts. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Praise you, God. It's key. Oneness is key. Unity is key. This disjointing and this, it has to go. Submit unto God. That's what he's saying. Submit, not your emotions, not your flesh, not what you think. Covenant relationship. 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment Because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not made perfect love. Been made made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Verse 24 of John 17. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Oh, yes, God. That they may behold my glory, which you have given me. This is the Lord's prayer for us. For you. And he answered it because we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. In Ephesians, it tells us this, that the Lord answered his prayer. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are in his glory. We're surrounded by his glory. When we choose to sit there. But what happens is a lot of times we jump down. Spiritually we stay, but emotionally. Let me tell you, we can, we're going to heaven, but we can live, you know what, on earth. But if we understand our persona that we truly are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And where Jesus said that under my feet is all principality and powers and rulers of darkness, 
They're under our feet too. That's who we are. Amen? Praise you, Jesus. Oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Let that revelation. You weren't created for sin. You weren't created to fail. You weren't created to live in depression. It's a foreign thing to your spirit, man. Did you know death is foreign? It, that's why when you see something, at least me, on the side of the road, you want to go rise it up from the dead? And we've stopped many times. Haven't we? In the middle of the street. Declaring life because death is foreign. It's not who we are. We came from life. We came from life. That's who we are. And we are death slayers. That's who we are. I am a death slayer. And when I see cancer, I want to slay that thing with my sword of life and resurrection that God has given me. The same power, the Bible says, that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me. So what's a little tumor? What's a little tumor? Jesus was raised from the dead. Give me a tumor. Let's see it fall off in my hands. By the power of almighty Jesus. Amen. We are death slaying, tongue talking, fire breathing army of God. <laughs> Worship team, come on up. Hushatalataka. This book is a must read. Covenant Relationships by um, Asher and Trader. He is a Messianic Jew. He lives in Israel. We've met him. He's tremendous. He writes deep. This will take you probably three years to read <laughs> because it's so thick. It's so thick. It talks about many things. I had things marked, but I'm just gonna read just a couple. In the ancient bi biblical, let me start with, having established the central importance of relationships in the meaning of life, we must now discover God's meaning for bringing those relationships to pass. How can we guarantee that these relationships will not be broken? What are the terms of any relationship I should enter into? How can I cause the other party in the relationship to be as committed to its success as I am? The answer to these questions is covenant covenant is a two-way street it's not about david and i going okay are you happy you know what can we do for you and and you know how can we meet your needs and, blah, 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 blah. and it's this it's a two-way relationship and it goes the other way where okay how can i pray for you pastor david and and what do you need and then we just sit there and go be gone little earthlings <laughs> Relationship is two ways. We give and then we receive. And then you give and then you receive. Relationship, covenant, not just, well, you know what? She's getting a little old and wrinkled, you know, and look at that little chick over there. <laughs> or, you know, my husband, he's getting a big belly. Look at that six... <laughs> No, you're not getting one. You're losing yours. It wasn't even that big. <laughs> oh, praise God. 
So let me get you. Let me get you. He's praying in tongues now. That means I'm in trouble. All right. <laughs> Covenant is an agreement between two parties to be committed to their relationship. Covenant is the commitment that lies behind any successful relationship. Covenant comprises the principles of integrity that guarantee a relationship will be preserved. I mean, it is, and I could go on and on, but I do want to close with this. Hallelujah. I hope this helped. If it didn't, you know, I enjoyed it. And God ministered to me. God did minister to me.